Hello everyone and welcome back to the Dungeon Learner's Guide. This week we've got another Commander's Guild deck tech. This is deck number 105 and it's titled Flash Drazi. And if you haven't seen the show before, what we are doing is randomly selecting a card from scryfall.com, working with a budget of $100 or less, and building a commander deck for Magic the Gathering around a theme of the chosen card. So before we jump into the actual deck tech, I do want to take a second to highlight some of our social media accounts, some ways that you can help support the channel if that's something you're interested in doing. If, of course, you don't want to support us on any of these platforms, you can always just like the video, subscribe to the channel. That does help out quite a bit. But if you're looking to do a little bit extra, you can follow us over on Twitter at 13POYNZ, Reddit, u slash POYNZ13. Send us an email, dungeonlearnersguide at gmail.com. All of those accounts are great ways to reach out if you ever have any questions, you ever want to suggest any cards, or you just want to chat. I'm more than happy to respond as much as I can on any of those. And if you're looking to support us a little bit more individually and personally, you can head on over to our TCG Player affiliate link, which is in the description of the video. And then, of course, you can also go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash Dungeon Learners Guide. That's where you get access to a ton of extra stuff like a Discord channel where we brew up the decks and also play the games. So if you want to be in the games on the channel, that is the way to do it. You'll also get access to the deck lists a week early. You'll get access to the unedited gameplay videos. You'll get access to a card sent to you every single month from me as a thank you for all of your support. And of course, in my personal opinion, what I think is the most important is that you have the guarantee from me that any cards you suggest to be turned into videos for this channel, I will turn them into videos at some point. It might take me a while because I have to work pretty far in advance for these videos, but I promise you I will get to them eventually. I can't make that guarantee for anyone other than our patrons, but that's not to say you can't suggest cards. I will do my best to get to all of them. I just can't guarantee it for anyone but our patrons. So before we move on, I do of course have to shout out our five current patrons. So we have William Swiftfoot, we've got Doodle, Calvin Schmidt, Eric Way, and Jeff Winger. To the five of you, thank you all so much for all of your support. And without any further ado, let's get into the actual deck. So first up, we got to start with our random card of the week. And this one was suggested to us by Neil Arnold over on YouTube. And the card that he suggested is going to be Reality Smasher. So Reality Smasher, four and a colorless mana for a 5-5 five, five Eldrazi. It's got Trample, Haste. Whenever Reality Smasher becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, counter that spell unless its controller discards a card. Now, it's very similar to having Ward on this creature, but it's very important to notice that it doesn't protect us from abilities. So if someone plays, say, like a Ravenous Chupacabra or some creature that comes into play and destroys a creature, it would still destroy Reality Smasher and they wouldn't have to discard a card. So that is something to be aware of. It's not abilities, it's just spells. But... When I got this card as our random card of the week, I kind of figured this was our chance to do something that we've actually never done on this channel before. And so our commander this week is going to be a great example of what we're doing because our commander is Liberator Urza's Battlethopter. We are playing for the first time in over 100 episodes a completely colorless deck. We have no colors in this commander deck this week, so we are running all of our artifacts and Eldrazi and all of our lands that don't produce any colored mana, and we're going to see how much we can do that on a $100 budget, which I think is a, quite the challenge in and of itself. But anyway, we've got Liberator at the head of this deck today, which is three mana for a 1-2 legendary artifact creature. It's a Thopter. has Flash, flying you may cast colorless spells and artifact spells as though they had flash and whenever you cast a spell if the amount of mana spent to cast that spell is greater than liberator's power put a plus one plus one counter on liberator so with our first card being an eldrazi with liberator giving all of our colorless stuff flash and caring about casting big spells it only makes sense that when we get to our first theme of the deck we are talking about Eldrazi. So we are going to be mainly an Eldrazi deck this week, and there are some other colorless creatures in there, which is why I wanted to highlight Eldrazi Mimic. 
Um, Eldrazi Mimic being one of the smaller Eldrazi, being a 2-mana two 2-1 two that specifically says whenever another colorless creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may change Eldrazi Mimic's base power and toughness to that creature's power and toughness until the end of turn. Normally, this wouldn't be super great because we wouldn't have a deck full of colorless creatures, but because we are a completely colorless deck, Eldrazi Mimic kind of gets a chance to shine. And it's very important that it does say colorless creature and not artifact creature or not Eldrazi creature, because we actually have all of those things. We have artifacts, we have Eldrazi, we are attempting to play as many colorless creatures as possible to make use of Liberator's ability. And of course, we got to play into Reality Smasher being an Eldrazi. So that is where Eldrazi Mimic is going to be representing our theme of just creatures, specifically Eldrazi, but more broadly, colorless creatures in general. Next up, since we are playing a colorless deck, we don't have access to a lot of efficient card draw or ramp. So instead of playing the typical things like Cultivate to get us to, you know, the lands that we need to cast our spells, we are instead playing Mana Rocks. So we have a ton of Mana Rocks in this deck, things that we can play for 2 to 3 to 4 mana that then produce more mana. Since a lot of our stuff is going to be very large, we need to make sure we can cast it in a timely manner and not just wait until we can hit 10 land drops. By the time we hit 10 land drops, we're probably just going to be dead. So we need to make sure that we can get our mana very, very quickly. And I tried to make sure that most of our mana rocks also did something else. There's some sort of utility to them. And so to represent that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Stone Speaker Crystal, which has very quickly become one of my favorite four mana mana rocks because it is four mana for an artifact that taps for two colorless and you can pay to tap it, sacrifice it, exile any number of target players' graveyards and draw a cart. That is incredibly useful because there's not a ton of graveyard hate in a colorless deck. So we're able to exile our opponent's graveyards and still draw a card if for some reason we have gotten to the point where we don't need this anymore, we were making maybe too much mana. So Stone Speaker Crystal is a great example of what we're trying to do with our mana rocks. We're trying to ramp, and once we've ramped and we may not need them anymore, then we can throw them away to get extra benefit. And then, of course, that leads us into our final theme of the week, which is the big stuff. We've got to be able to cast all of the giant Eldrazi, giant artifact creatures that exist in Magic, and so that's how we're going to try to win the game. And of course, we got to use Stone Speaker Crystal to get there. We've got to use small creatures like Eldrazi Mimic to get there. But eventually, we're going to be dropping things like Path Razor of Ulamog, which is a massive 11 mana for a 9-9 Eldrazi. It's got Annihilator 3 and it can't be blocked except by three or more creatures. So we can guarantee that we, once this hits the board, have a huge threat in play because our opponents are going to struggle to block it. They have to sacrifice permanence. It's a 9-9. There's not going to be much they can do about a creature that just comes down and starts swinging every single turn and is causing a lot of chaos. And obviously, Pathraiser is not the only giant Eldrazi we have. We have a bunch of them in the deck you know, especially because they're our win condition, but especially too, because we need these big Eldrazi to be our payoffs for things like Stone Spreaker Crystal. Since we're completely colorless, there's not a great amount of win conditions that don't cost a ton of mana. So we have to make sure we have that mana. And of course, we got to have the payoffs. So those are our themes for the deck this week. And of course, the next thing we got to do is talk a little bit about some key cards. These are the cards that while they may not necessarily always be win conditions on their own, they are incredibly powerful and important to what our deck is trying to do. So the first of those key cards is going to be Endbringer. And Endbringer is five and a colorless for five, five Eldrazi. And it untaps during each other player's untap step. Then we can tap it to do one damage to any target pay a colorless and tap it, target creature can't attack or block this turn, and pay two colorless and tap it to draw a card. I probably don't have to explain why Endbringer is so good in this deck. If we are making a ton of mana, and we've gotten to the point where we can cast Endbringer for six mana, now 
we have the six mana to draw a card on each of our opponent's turns. That means we're drawing four cards all the way around the table if we include the one in our draw step. Plus, if we get to eight mana, we can then just draw a fifth card on our turn, meaning we can consistently refill our hand. We can also do damage to anything, and this is literally anything. It's planeswalkers, creatures, opponents, and we can also prevent ourselves from being attacked or prevent our opponents from blocking. So Endbringer really does everything that we want it to do and is incredibly powerful in this deck because there's not a ton of utility in colorless. We tend to kind of do the same thing over and over, so it's nice to have something that can attack or block because it's a 5-5. It can do one damage to any target. It can make sure that something else can't attack or block. It can draw a card. Endbringer... It really does it all. I can't hype it up enough. If you're playing a colorless deck, you probably have already heard of Endbringer, but if you haven't, very important card for the archetype. That, though, leads us into our second key card, and that is going to be Moon Silver Key. Now, personally, when this card first came out, I wasn't very hyped about it. I didn't expect it to be very powerful. I didn't think it was going to do too much. Obviously, by the fact that it's a recent uncommon that's still a dollar in price tag, other people have proven me wrong, and after playing it a few times, I completely understand why. So Moon Silver Key, two mana for an artifact. You can pay one, tap it, sacrifice it, and search your library for an artifact card with a mana ability or a basic land card. Reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Since we are a colorless deck, we don't have a ton of ways of getting the cards that we need. So Moonsilver Key acts as a tutor, especially because we have so many mana rocks with utility effects on them. So if we're searching our library for an artifact card with a mana ability, that means we can go and get Stone Speaker Crystal to exile graveyards. We can get Dreamstone Hedron to draw additional cards. We can get Palladium Mirror to block something. There's a ton of ways that we can kind of take advantage of this and tutor out the cards that we need. And in a worst case scenario, it just gets us a land. And then we hit our land drop and we keep going. So Moon Silver Key is a phenomenal card. And I really can't talk about how great it is because every time I play it, it does phenomenal things. And that's coming from someone who really didn't expect it to be good when it was first previewed. So Moon Silver Key, MVP of the deck, absolutely phenomenal card. But let's get into our last key card, which is a card that you've probably heard of but you might not have heard of in an Eldrazi archetype, and that is Mystic Forge. Mystic Forge is four mana for an artifact that says you may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card or a colorless non-land card. Tap, pay one life, exile the top card of your library. Most of the time, when you see this card, it's in artifact decks because it can cast artifacts from the top of your deck. But I think the piece that often goes unnoticed is that it also casts colorless non-land cards. You know what Eldrazi are. They are colorless non-land cards. So this is another great form of card draw because we are able to cast spells from the top of our deck, maybe go until we hit a land, draw the land for turn, play it, then keep going. So this is a great way to have card advantage in an archetype and a, I guess in a color, in a colorless, that doesn't necessarily always have card draw or card advantage. So Mystic Forge is really an all-star in this deck, and it can get tough because we do actually have to pay the mana for the stuff that we're casting. So if we're hitting things like Endbringer or Pathraiser, we're spending a lot of mana but it's still better than drawing it and then casting it next turn because we get to cast it now and draw something else next turn. So Mystic Forge, once again, definitely an MVP of this deck. It can't hype it up enough. It does everything we want it to do in terms of card draw. So these are our key cards of the week. And I think the next thing we're going to have to do for our deck tech is take a look at some cool interactions. These are cards that synergize very well together, or maybe that I just want to highlight because I think they're kind of cool and how they work together. But our first cool interaction is going to be between Oblivion Sower and Bane of Bala Ged. So Oblivion Sower Six mana for a 5-8 creature Eldrazi. When you cast Oblivion Sower, target opponent exiles the top four cards of their library. Then you may put any number of land cards that player owns from exile onto the battlefield under your control. So best case scenario, our opponents 
maybe have no cards in exile, we cast Oblivion Sower, we hit four cards, we all of them are lands, we put them all into play, right? That's great. But if we combine that up with Bane of Balaged, which is seven mana for a 7-5 Eldrazi, that says whenever Bane of Balaged attacks, defending player exiles two permanents they control. The often missed part of Oblivion Sower is that it says you may put any number of land cards that player owns from exile onto the battlefield under your control. They do not have to be exiled with Oblivion Sower. So if we're attacking our opponents with Bane of Balaged, they're exiling their permanents, there's a good chance they'll exile at least one, maybe even two lands because they don't want to exile their mana rocks. They don't want to exile all of their, you know, utility creatures or their big beefy creatures. So we can kind of sneak a few more lands into exile so that when Oblivion Sower comes down, we're at least guaranteed to hit some lands because, you know, maybe worst case scenario, we don't hit anything with the Oblivion Sower. So that way we're able to kind of pick and choose the opponent who has the most lands in exile. We can see what's going on with all of that. And maybe we also just get lucky and Oblivion Sower hits a bunch of lands. The other thing that I do want to point out about Oblivion Sower because Oblivion Sower, if you can't tell, one of my personal favorite cards, I put this in a lot of my decks, is that the lands actually just come into play. They don't come into play tapped. You don't have to, you know, give them back at the end of turn. If you hit four lands, you essentially just spent two mana on an Oblivion Sower because now those four lands can immediately tap for mana. So that is incredibly powerful especially if we already have Bane of Balaged ready and going at the table, attacking and exiling and hitting people for seven. So these two cards synergize super well together, and really you could put any other exile piece into the place of Bane of Balaged, but because Bane exiles two things every time it attacks, it pretty much is the best we've got in this deck. So that leads us then to our next cool interaction, which is going to be between Desolation Twin and Gruesome Slaughter. So Desolation Twin, 10 mana for a 10-10 Eldrazi. When you cast a spell, create a 10-10 colorless Eldrazi creature token. And we're going to combine that up with Gruesome Slaughter, which is 6 mana for a sorcery. Until end of turn, colorless creatures you control gain tap. This creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature. So essentially, we play Desolation Twin, we now have two 10-10s, we cast Gruesome Slaughter, both of our 10-10s can now tap and do 10 damage to any creature on the board. There's a very good chance 10 damage will kill any creature on the board, except for maybe ours, and make sure that we can clear the way for any other creatures to attack, meaning that we can essentially turn Gruesome Slaughter into a one-sided board wipe. We can use all of our Eldrazi and all of our artifact creatures to kind of mow down the rest of the board, making it so that either on our next turn when we attack, our opponents probably haven't been able to rebuild enough to stop the army, or we leave some creatures untapped and we can kind of sneak through some attackers even after tapping some of our huge creatures. So I'm a big fan of Gruesome Slaughter in this deck, and Desolation Twin is just two 10-10s for 10 mana, so... It makes the perfect sense to try to combine these two as much as possible. But those are all of our cool interactions for the week. And of course, the last thing we have to do for this deck tech is talk a little bit about the price. Since this is a budget show, we are trying to build under a $100 budget. This week, we came in at $99.68 with our most expensive card being Forsaken Monument. Forsaken Monument is a five mana legendary artifact Colorless creatures you control get plus two, plus two. Whenever you tap a permanent four colorless, add an additional colorless. And whenever you cast a colorless spell, you gain two life. I probably don't have to explain why this card is so good in this deck. It's giving all of our creatures an additional plus two, plus two. Every single permanent we tap for mana, whether it's a mana rock, whether it's a land, is now making an additional mana. And all of our spells we cast gain us two life. So Forsaken Monument really is the all-star in this deck. It does everything we want it to do. And there's no way to kind of get around the fact that all of this is going to most likely push us toward a huge victory in the game. It's also worth noting that the phrase, whenever you tap a permanent for colorless, add an additional colorless, is technically a mana ability. 
So earlier when we talked about moon silver key, if we wanted to search up an artifact with moon silver key, we can actually get Forsaken Monument with that, meaning that we can tutor this out of our deck at any point when we need it, as long as we, of course, have the key. So that is the most expensive card in the deck and a good portion of our budget this week. If you did need to cut it, there is a way to do that, but it is incredibly powerful and I think it's worth the $10, so it's very difficult for me to argue to cut this. However, I do want to take a second to also talk about another reason this deck is so expensive. And it's not actually one card in particular, it's 16 cards in particular, because we are running 16 wastes as our basic lands in this deck. Normally, when we put basic lands into the deck, they count for 4 to 5 to 6 cents each. The wastes are costing a dollar each. That makes it incredibly difficult to trim down the price when our 16 basic lands are costing us $16 of our total budget limit. That's not exactly where we want to be. And unfortunately, there's no real way to get around this unless you want to replace all or most of the wastes with other utility colorless lands, which there are plenty of. They are definitely cheaper. There are some that are, you know, 25 cents or so. So that could be another way to trim down the price of the deck. But I did want to talk a little bit about this because I want to make sure that you're aware. Even though it's not one card, it's 16 cards. That's still $16 of our budget just going to our basic lands. So that is very tricky and it makes it very difficult to build a colorless deck, which if I'm being perfectly honest is one of the main reasons I haven't done this sooner is because it just is so tricky to try to make a good budget mana base. But anyway, enough about that. Let's talk a little bit about some out of budget upgrades. Let's talk about what you could throw into this deck if you were interested in making it a little bit better, but a little less concerned about the budget. Now, the short answer to this question of what you should put into the deck if you have no budget is, of course, the Eldrazi Titans. I wasn't able to squeeze any of them into the deck. That's Ulamog, Kozilek, and Emrakul. So if you have all of the Ulamogs, the Kozileks, the Emrakuls, definitely put them into the deck. However, I'm not going to talk about all five of those cards. Not six because one of the Emrakuls is banned, but the five that are legal. However, I do want to talk about two of the Titans in particular. And when I say two of the Titans, I do actually mean one of the Titans, but both of their cards. So we're going to talk a little bit about Kozilek. And the reason that I want to highlight Kozilek in particular is because he's card draw, or it's card draw, I'm not 100% sure. So Kozilek Butcher of Truth, for example, is 10 mana for a 12-12 legendary creature Eldrazi. When you cast this spell, draw 4 cards, Annihilator 4. When it's put into a graveyard from anywhere, its owner shuffles their graveyard into their library. So the reason that I want to highlight Kozilek is literally just because it draws cards. It's, again, like we talked about earlier, very difficult for us to draw a bunch of cards. So we want to make sure that we have as much card draw as possible so we can empty our hand to mana rocks, to giant creatures, and then just replace it as soon as possible. And so my recommendation for if you want to put in Kozilek, Butcher of Truth, is to take out another big creature that is not necessarily bad, but it's not nearly as good as Kozilek, and that would be Eldrazi Devastator, which is 8 mana, so 2 mana cheaper than Kozilek, but it's just an 8-9 with Trample. There's no other abilities, it doesn't draw cards, doesn't have Annihilator, so if I had to choose between these two creatures, I would definitely choose Kozilek over the Devastator. The unfortunate side of that is that Kozilek is $24 and the Devastator is $0.22, cents. so obviously... For budget purposes, it makes a lot more sense to go with the Devastator, but if you're not worried about budget, then Kozilek is a great upgrade. Now, the next Kozilek that we're going to take a look at is, in a bit of a controversial opinion, what I believe is the better of the two Kozileks, and that is actually going to be Kozilek the Great Distortion. So Kozilek the Great Distortion, still 10 mana, just like the original, but it's 8 and 2 colorless specifically, for a 12-12 legendary creature Eldrazi, when you cast Kozilek the Great Distortion, if you have fewer than 7 cards in hand, draw cards equal to the difference, menace, 
discard a card with converted mana cost X, counter target spell with converted mana cost X. So the reason I think this one is actually better than the previous Kazalek is because it can draw you more than four cards. So if you have zero cards in hand when you cast it, you actually draw seven cards instead of just four. And it also acts as an interaction piece. You're able to counter spells, which is incredibly powerful in a colorless deck. And to keep adding on to this, if we have Liberator in play, we can flash in Kozilek at the end of someone's turn or in response to a big spell, making sure that we then draw a ton of cards and can counter something at instant speed the way that a normal, possibly blue deck would and our opponents might not be expecting that. So Kozilek plays multiple roles in this, and yeah, he's a little bit worse in terms of stats because we have Menace instead of Annihilator, and Annihilator will win the game a lot faster than Menace, but still a 12-12, still able to put a lot of pressure on our opponents. So if you're able to slot in this Kozilek, it is much cheaper. Instead of $24, it's 13 Still above our budget limit. But I will be honest, this was the last Titan I cut out of the deck. I really tried to keep it in there, and I just couldn't quite do it, so had to be replaced. But if you have the ability to put it back into the deck, the card that I would recommend swapping it out for is Ruin Processor, which is 7 mana for a 7-8 Eldrazi Processor. When you cast Ruin Processor, you may put a card an opponent owns from exile into that player's graveyard. If you do, you gain 5 life. Now... Once again, not a bad card, but in Commander, gaining 5 life isn't going to be super relevant, especially because we don't have any synergies to go along with that. So otherwise, it's just a 7 mana 7-8, seven, which, while not bad, is not good either. So if you have the chance to swap out Ruin Processor and put in Kozilek, I do think it would make the deck a lot better. But there's a difference between $13 and 11 cents. So for budget reasons, if you got to keep in the Ruin Processor, it's not going to do a bad job. All right, so that brings us, though, to the end of our deck tech. I know this was a bit of a long one. I had a lot to say about our first colorless deck. But as always, we've got to see how this deck will perform in a game. So we are going to run this deck up against three opponents this week, and we're going to find out just how good it really is. So... This week, we are joined by Bilal, playing Liliana, Heretical Healer, Jason, playing Kamiz, Obscura Oculus, and Sean, playing Ashcoat of the Shadow Swarm. Now, starting with Bilal, this is kind of a Liliana deck. He wants to play as many Liliana cards as possible, but it's also just kind of a mono-black value deck. He wants to just play a ton of great mono-black creatures and get a ton of devotion, make a ton of mana with things like Cabal Coffers, so... Very interested to see how this deck is going to go. I'm not super worried about Liliana Heretical Healer, but I am a little worried about when she flips to Liliana Defiant Necromancer. The fact that she can plus two to make each player discard a card is not going to be super great for us because we're not going to have a ton of cards in our hand at any given time because we want to just ramp and then play our big spells and we'll probably not have a ton of card draw. So that does concern me a little bit. Next up, we have Jason and his Kamiz deck. This is mostly the Precon deck, but he did say that he upgraded it a little bit. So Kamiz is going to be making stuff unblockable, giving smaller creatures double strike and conniving. And I don't know if we have a great way to deal with that either. Making something unblockable when all of our creatures are massive doesn't do us a lot of good. So really my only hope is that we can kind of crack back for more damage than he's able to hit us with and just win the race in the long run. And then finally, we have Sean and his Ashcoat deck. And this is his first time playing his rat deck with Ashcoat at the helm. He used to have another rat at the lead. I don't quite remember what it was off the top of my head. I want to say it was Maronar. So this is going to be his first test run with Ashcoat. And I have to say, while Liliana and Kamiz are very powerful... I'm definitely most concerned about Ashcoat because I know this is a rat colony deck and all of his rat colonies get plus X plus O where X is the number of other rats he controls and then Ashcoat gives plus X plus X where X is the number of other rats he controls. So I imagine that once he gets a couple of rat colonies in play, they are going to be an absolutely massive threat swinging for 
maybe 10 damage as long as he's just got a couple of rats in play. So very concerned about Ashcoat. I don't know if we have the speed to keep up with it or the number of blockers to stop all of the rats that'll be coming our way. So that is the deck that I'm the most concerned about this week. Although I suppose you could make an argument for any of the others. So let me know down in the comments which of these decks you think is the most concerning for our deck. And then we'll see in the game if your predictions turn out to be correct. But I think we should jump into this game. I hope you're excited for it. I know I am. And I will talk to you all once it's done. At the start of the game, I go first, followed by Bilal, Jason, and then Sean. On my first turn, I play a Zelfir in Void, scrying one. Bilal plays a Swamp. Jason plays an Obscura Storefront, which sacrifices itself to search his library for a Plains, putting it into play tapped and gaining a life. Sean plays a Swamp. I play an Urza's Tower. Bilal plays a Swamp. Jason plays an Island and casts Trionic Resonator, letting him pay 2 mana and tap it to double any of his triggered abilities. Sean plays a Swamp and casts Rat Colony, which gets plus 1 plus 0 for each other rat he controls. I play a Demolition Field. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts Liliana of the Veil, activating her minus 2 ability to make Sean sacrifice a creature, killing his Rat Colony. Jason plays an Esper Panorama, sacrificing it to search his library for a Swamp, putting it into play tapped. Sean plays a Cabal Stronghold and then casts another Rat Colony. Then, at the end of turn, I flash in my commander, Liberator Urza's Battlethopter, letting me cast colorless spells as though they had flash, and also putting a plus one plus one counter on it whenever I cast a colorless spell with mana value higher than Liberator's power. Then I play on Bonder's Enclave and move to combat, attacking Liliana for one, killing the Planeswalker. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts Read the Bones, scrying two, drawing two cards, and losing two life. Jason plays a Sky Cloud Expanse and casts his commander, Kamiz Obscura of Gillis, letting him make an attacking creature unblockable when it attacks, letting it connive, and then giving another attacking creature with less power double strike. Sean plays a Witch's Cottage untapped, putting the Rat Colony in his graveyard back on top of his library. Unfortunately, since he only controlled two swamps, it should have entered tapped and not returned the Rat Colony, but we don't catch that at the time. Then he casts his commander Ashcoat of the Shadow Swarm, giving his rats plus X plus X when it attacks, where X is the number of other rats he controls, and also letting him mill four cards in his end step, returning two rats from his graveyard to his hand. He then attacks Bilal for three, and in his end step, mills four and returns two rat colonies. At the end of turn, I flash in Thran Dynamo, putting a plus one plus one counter on Liberator. Then on my turn, I play a Temple of the False God and attack Sean for two with Liberator. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts his commander, Liliana Heretical Healer. Jason plays a Vault of Champions and attacks Bilal for two, conniving away a land and making Kamiz unblockable. Then, in his second main phase, Jason casts Custody Lich, becoming the Monarch when it enters and making target opponent sacrifice a creature when he becomes the Monarch. With this trigger, he targets me, and in response, I flash in Kozilek's Channeler, putting a plus one plus one counter on Liberator and then sacrificing the Channeler. Sean plays a Temple of the False God and casts three more Rat Colonies, then he moves to combat, attacking Bilal with Ashcoat for three, and me with a Rat Colony. This triggers Ashcoat's ability, giving his other rats plus five plus five, so I take a total of 11 damage. Then in his end step, he mills four more cards and returns two Rat Colonies from his graveyard to his hand, and, still at the end of turn, I flash in a Hedron Archive, putting another counter on Liberator. On my turn, I play a Scavenger Grounds and cast Swiftfoot Boots, equipping them to Liberator, giving it Hexproof and Haste. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts a Wayfarer's Bauble, sacrificing it to search his library for a Swamp and putting it into play tapped.
Jason plays a Dark Water Catacombs, and moves to combat attacking Sean with Custody Lich, making it unblockable and conniving away a land, but before damage, he ninjutsus in Silent Blade Oni, returning the Lich to his hand, doing 6 damage to Sean, looking at Sean's hand, which is revealed due to the limitations of playing over webcam, and casts a spell from his hand without paying its mana cost, in this case, Whip of Erebos, giving all his creatures lifelink. Sean foretells a card, casts Zulaport Cutthroat, making each opponent lose a life while he gains a life whenever one of his creatures dies, and then also casts Throne of the God Pharaoh, making each opponent lose a life in his end step for each tapped creature he controls. He then attacks Jason with two Rat Colonies and Ashcoat, and attacks Bilal with two Rat Colonies. This triggers Ashcoat, giving all of his rats plus 5 plus 5, making each colony an 11 10. Jason and Bilal both block with their commanders, killing them, then Bilal takes 11 damage and Jason takes 12 after gaining some life thanks to the Whip of Erebos. This also has Sean becoming the monarch, and at the end of turn, each of his opponents loses 5 life since he controls 5 tapped creatures. He also mills 4, not returning any rats to his hand, and still at the end of turn, I sacrifice Hedron Archive to draw 2 cards, and cast Stone Speaker Crystal, followed by a Burnished Heart. On my turn, I play a Ghost Quarter and attack Sean for 4 with Liberator, becoming the Monarch. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts Ayara, first of Lochthwain, making each opponent lose a life while he gains a life whenever a black creature enters the battlefield under his control. He then casts Chainer, Dementia Master, giving all Nightmares plus 1 plus 1, and letting him pay 3 mana and 3 life to put a creature from a graveyard into play under his control, triggering Ayara, making each opponent lose a life while he gains a life. Jason plays a Swamp and casts Custody Lich, becoming the Monarch and making me sacrifice a creature, killing the Burnished Heart. This lets him attack me with Silent Blade Oni for 6, revealing my hand and casting a spell for free from it. He also activates Stryonic Resonator to copy the effect, but unfortunately for him though, the only non-land card in my hand is Scour from Existence, but that does let him exile Ashcoat. On Sean's turn, he casts 3 more rat colonies, and then attacks me and Jason both for 16 damage with only 2 rats. Before the blocks, I sacrifice Stone Speaker Crystal to draw a card and exile Sean's graveyard. Then I'm able to cast Moon Silver Key, sacrificing it to search my library for an artifact with a mana ability, putting it into my hand. This lets me get Palladium Mirror, which I'm able to cast and use to block a rat, while Jason blocks a rat with Custody Lich, killing all 4 creatures, with Jason and I only taking 8 damage each. Then, since 2 of Sean's creatures died, he gains 2 life and each opponent loses 2 life. At the end of turn, we all lose an additional 2 life since Sean controls 2 tapped creatures. Still at the end of turn, I basic land cycle and ash barons to search my library for a waste, putting it into my hand. On my turn I play a waste and attack Sean for 4, reclaiming the monarchy. Bilal plays a Swamp and casts Magus of the Coffers, which can tap for mana equal to the number of swamps he controls. Jason plays a Command Tower and casts Rexiel the Risen Deep, letting him cast an instant or sorcery from a player's graveyard without paying its mana cost when it deals combat damage to them. He also casts a Mask of Riddles and then passes. Sean plays a Swamp and then casts Bolas' Citadel, letting him cast spells or play lands from the top of his library by paying life instead of mana. He then attacks Jason with all of his rats for 30 total damage, but before blocks, Bilal activates Chainer to return Jason's Custody Lich to the battlefield under his control, making each opponent lose a life, becoming the Monarch, and forcing Sean to sacrifice a creature, killing the Cutthroat, making each of his opponents lose a life while Sean gains a life. Then, Jason then blocks two of the rats, killing all of the creatures except Rexiel, gaining 11 life and taking 18 damage. Before Sean moves to his end step, I draw a card with Bonder's Enclave, and finally I do the only thing I can do, casting a Breaker of Armies, but unfortunately this still doesn't save me from when Throne of the God Pharaoh triggers at the end of Sean's turn, making each of his opponents lose 3 life, knocking me out of the game.
Bilal plays a Cabal Coffers, then recasts his commander Liliana, making each opponent lose a life while he gains a life, and activates Ayara, sacrificing Liliana to draw a card. After that, he casts Sanguine Bond, making target opponent lose life equal to any amount of life he gains, then uses Chainer to return Liliana from the graveyard to the battlefield, making each opponent lose a life while he gains a life, and then also makes Sean lose an additional life. He moves to combat, attacking Sean for 4. Jason plays an island and attacks Sean for 5, gaining 5 life and triggering Rex Seal, but Sean has no instants or sorceries in his graveyard for Jason to cast. Then in his second main phase, Jason casts a Cephalid Face Taker, he also casts a Shadow Mage Infiltrator, and finally casts an Azorius Signet. Sean plays a Swamp and casts Haunting Voyage from Fortel, returning all rats from his graveyard to the battlefield, letting him get back 4 total rat colonies. He attacks Jason with 3 rats for 24 total damage, blocking 2, killing all 4 creatures, but only taking 8 damage. Unfortunately, Jason accidentally takes 16 damage instead, leaving him at only 1 life when he should have been at 9. Before Sean moves to his end step, Bilal casts Dark Bargain, looking at the top 3 cards of his library, putting 2 into his hand and the other into his graveyard, losing 2 life. He also uses Chainer to return Sean's Zulaport Cutthroat from his graveyard to the battlefield, gaining a life and making Sean lose 2. Then Sean moves to his end step, triggering the throne, making each opponent lose a life, knocking Jason out of the game. On Bilal's turn, he plays a Swamp and moves straight to combat, attacking Sean for 3 with Liliana and 4 with the Magus. Unfortunately, since Liliana has left Link and Bilal controls Zulaport Cutthroat, there's no way that Sean can block to let himself survive, especially because in his second main phase, Bilal casts Mutilate, giving all creatures minus 10 minus 10 since he controls 10 Swamps, knocking Sean out with all the Zulaport Cutthroat triggers, winning Bilal the game. All right, so that was a sweet game. Let's go around the table, talk about each of the decks, and then we'll kind of end with ours. So let's start with Sean and his rat deck. I was kind of right in my prediction that the rats were going to be very quick and very strong, and he started hitting for a ton of damage as soon as Ashcoat hit the board. So I think overall it was very impressive. He got, unfortunately, very unlucky at the end of the game because every time he used Bolas' Citadel, it was a land. Not just like, oh, most of the time. It was literally every single time. He played a land, cast Bolas' Citadel, had a land on top. Next turn, played a land from the top, and then saw another land on top with Bolas' Citadel. So he got incredibly unlucky, and I think that if he'd been able to hit just a couple more rats, he probably could have won the game there. So very impressive showing by Ashcoat. Uh, next up, Jason and Kamiz. He didn't do a ton of damage throughout the course of the game, but it was kind of cool to see Kamiz making things unblockable that care about combat damage and hitting your opponents. So I think that if Jason had had a few more creatures and hadn't had to kind of chump block them into the rats, I think that he would have done much better throughout the course of the game. And then finally, of course, our winner, Bilal, uh, really just kind of stayed behind, didn't, didn't do too much to make himself look like a threat, and then eventually was able to just slowly drain out the rest of the table with the combination of Ayara and Lifelink and Sanguine Bond and just a ton of neat mono-black synergies. We didn't get to see a ton of Liliana's show up, which probably worked out in our favor, let's be honest, so very, very good showing by Bilal. And then, of course, talking about our deck, I think even though we didn't win and we were, unfortunately, the first ones knocked out of the game, it still did a very good job of showing the power of Liberator. Being able to flash in Mana Rocks and Eldrazi at the end of people's turns felt very, very powerful. And if we'd been able to flash in something like one of the Eldrazi Titans like Kozilek or Ulamog and just immediately untap and start swinging, essentially giving it haste, that would feel incredibly powerful, and I don't know what our opponents can really do to prepare for it. And there were a couple of times that Liberator actually saved us throughout the game, because Sean attacked us with rats for exactly lethal, and we were able to flash in blockers, or we were able to flash in Moonsilver Key, tutor up Palladium Mirror, flash that in to block with it. We were able to flash in uh, Kozlek's Channeler so that we didn't have to sacrifice our commander. So there was a lot of cool synergies with Liberator. 
And I am sad that we got knocked out first, but I think it still had a very good showing nonetheless. So let me know what you thought of the deck. Let me know if there's any cards you would suggest putting in or taking out. Let me know what you thought of the game. I'd love to hear all the comments and all the feedback. And I suppose with all of that being said, I will see you all on the other side of the Dungeon Learner's Guide.